It's super early. I am very tired right now because I can never go to sleep early enough when I have to fly out at 5 a.m. But that's okay because I am going on a Panasonic trip to play with the GH5S. I have to give a big shout out to Panasonic for flying me out to New York and inviting me to this press event. I definitely was not expecting that, so thank you Panasonic. I'm glad to be able to go and once again, all my content is as least biased as possible. You guys will see that going forward. I always put out my true 100% honest opinions as you guys have seen in the past. And just like that, I am in New York at the Highline Hotel. So the GH5S event actually starts tomorrow, so today I'm gonna go hang out with... Let's go find something to eat, man. Let's, let's do the meatball shop. Let's do it. Yeah. So Jordan and I had a good time hanging out and enjoying some delicious food, and thankfully he had a GH5S, so I was able to compare it to my GH5 and my Sony a6500. Rec 709, F28. At 3200, you could see how much cleaner the GH5S is, even though the GH5 is still usable. Bumping up to 6400, in my opinion, the GH5 is no longer usable. We have a lot of noise, and we're starting to see some color shift where the GH5S is clean. 12,800. There's no point. <laughs> And just like Jordan mentioned, there is no point shooting at 12,800 on the GH5, where the GH5S is still usable if you need to get the shot. It's even cleaner than the GH5 at 6,400. In comparing it to 3,200 on the GH5, it is a little bit more noisy, but not that big of a difference. So we have roughly one and two thirds stops of improvement. And here's a quick comparison against the Sony a6500. It is close, but the Sony is a bit cleaner. Taking another look against the GH5, you can see how much cleaner it is at 3200 in this scene. 6400, there's no comparison. And at 12,800, I think the GH5S is showing a little bit more noise than I would like, but it's way better than the GH5. Now let's compare the GH5S against the Sony a6500, and the Sony does look cleaner to me, especially in the higher ISOs. Here at 12,800 ISO, you definitely see a lot less noise in the dark shadows on the Sony. Here we're gonna compare it against 6400 on the GH5S, and still the Sony looks slightly cleaner in the shadows. So I am off once again. Jordan is being very nice from the camera store and letting me test my GH5 against the GH5S. So yesterday you guys saw some low light tests. Today I wanna to compare the 4K quality against it because it is using less data to create that image. And then on top of that, 1080 at 24, 1080 at 120, which is kinda of like the best quality if you want slow motion on the GH5. And then I'm also gonna test that 1080 at 180, which had noticeable quality loss. We'll see if the GH5S does better. I'm also going to throw in 1080 at 240 since it is capable of doing that now, but that does use a crop. I thought the crop went in if you go any higher than 180, but it actually lets you go to 192 and you still don't have any crop. And then when you go to 204, you guys see it says crop on right there, all the way up to 240, but we'll see what kind of a quality we get. Let's start out in 4K, and first off, I do want to point out the color differences. The GH5S is using an updated picture profile that has more Canon-like colors. Most people are agreeing with that statement, and I do prefer it, at least in this shot. Now, I was expecting the GH5 to totally beat out the GH5S in 4K detail, but even punching it at 200% here, I am not seeing that big of a difference, even looking up really closely. And that was definitely surprising because the GH5S is not oversampling a 
bunch of extra data. Now moving on to 1080p here, I was expecting the GH5S to do better because it has to deal with less data and throw less data away, but once again, I was wrong. The shots look very, very similar. I looked at this for multiple minutes trying to see a big difference, and there really isn't. The GH5S is not doing much better than the GH5, which is okay because the GH5 already does a great job. At 180 frames per second, we are starting to see some aliasing, and I was expecting less on the GH5S because it has less data to deal with, but it actually has a little bit more, especially if you're looking at uh, the middle right-hand side on those columns, we're seeing more jaggedy lines on the GH5S. Moving on to 180 frames per second, both of them get softer, and maybe the GH5 is slightly more detailed, but once again, the GH5S also has more aliasing. Now we're looking at 240 frames per second on the GH5S, and we are seeing even more aliasing and maybe slightly less detail, but it's not as bad as I expected given the extra crop that we get. Now I do want to make it clear that I am glad that Panasonic is putting in these modes, the 180, the 240, even if it comes with an image quality loss, more aliasing, or even a crop, I would much rather have the ability to shoot in those higher frame rates if I need to, then not have that option at all, which is what a lot of other manufacturers do. Now, as far as the actual exterior, there's almost no difference. We have kind of the red ring around here. We have uh, the red record button, which they changed the shape of it. It's not any easier to press, I don't think. And then of course we have the little S that was uh, so infamous of getting leaked on the front. Other than that, we no longer have IBIS, so our sensor is not shaking and moving around, which is great for productions where they're mounting this to rigs, driving fast, going over bumps, because the previous IBIS was not able to handle all that and stay still enough to get good footage. That's what the explanation that kind of I got from multiple uh, production houses that do shoot like that, and they were ending up not buying GH5s, they would buy GH4s and use those. So this is kind of an answer to that need as well without the IBIS. Now this sensor is larger in here compared to the GH5. I think the number is 1.86 crop, but that's only if you're shooting in the cinema 4K mode. Uh, if you're shooting in 16 by nine, it's really close to a two times crop. Now, what you gotta think about in that cinema 4K mode, if you're using a speed booster, like uh, Jordan right now has the 0.71, the speed booster ultra on here, um, you actually get like a 1.32 or something like that crop factor. So bigger than the Super 35 sensor equivalent with a speed booster. But with lenses like the Sigma 18 to 35, if it's not a full frame lens, you will get some vignetting on the outsides. So our main shooting event for the GH5S was a show called Sleep No More. Now I was so shocked by how dark it was in this hotel room, it was crazy. Even with the f1.7 lens, I was shooting at 6400, 12800, and in some of these scenes, even like 25600, or cranking it up to 51000 to be able to see kind of the introduction. It was very difficult to see, even with our own eyes. It was kind of crazy. This event, as you can see, is it's a, a darkened area, which is perfect for the what the GH5S can actually do. There's going to be a lot of action around in this area for, for everyone to film and kind of get your own take and look on how you guys want to work with the camera. The actors were like walking around everywhere, doing their own thing, and we were able to walk around everywhere and record from different angles and get a variety of shots like you guys are seeing, and I spent most of the time shooting on a gimbal. Starting off, I was not using autofocus, I was just going into manual because I kind of didn't trust it, but after a while, since I was on a gimbal, I was like, hey, let's test this out. I used a single zone spot type of mode, and I was honestly quite surprised by how well it did. 
It was shocking, actually. Now, it wasn't perfect, but the low light scenarios were really crazy. Uh, Hugh had his A7R3 there, and it still did struggle because of how dark it was. Now I think for the contrast detection autofocusing system, this kind of scenario helped a little bit because you had like spotlights and then super dark blacks and shadows, so the contrast is able to be picked up a little bit more. Uh, but once I talked to Sean, he mentioned to try out the face detection, which I wasn't using because I didn't trust it from before, but they have improved it quite a bit. And now the system is able to actually see not only faces, but whole bodies at a time. And in this scene here, you guys are seeing how it's picking up all those different subjects and the face at the same time. Now, I think this is because even though it's still using the same processor, the GH5S has almost half the data that it has to deal with. On the GH5, we're using a much higher resolution sensor. So the GH5 is taking almost twice the data needed for 4K, processing that and sampling it down meaning it's much tougher for the processor to deal with all of that. So now the processor can go through all that data much faster or much more efficient, definitely helping out with autofocus. So we're out here doing some autofocus tests. I really was not planning for this. It is really cold right now. But when we were shooting, yeah, no gloves. When we were shooting yesterday in the super low light environment, uh, it actually, the GH5S was surprising me on what it was doing. So we were not planning to do autofocus, but since it was surprising, we decided to come and check it out. So I'm here with Hugh Brownstone and with Sean from Panasonic. I never thought I'd be doing an autofocus test with the <laughs> Panasonic guy here. But this is cool. So it's freezing. We're going to keep this quick. I have to admit that our autofocusing test was not perfect. They were not the same lenses. Uh, both were set to f4. Our GH5 had the 12 to 35 to 8. Our GH5S had the 12 to 60, the new one. Um, and I don't think the 12 to 60 is much faster. In my previous tests, they're quite similar. Uh, but here, it's kind of a hit or miss at 24 frames per second. Sometimes the GH5S did a little bit better. Sometimes the GH5 did a little bit better. But there wasn't a big difference. Now moving over to 4K60, I think the GH5S did slightly better. As you can tell, none of them are perfect now. They're focusing on the background here. Both of them like to stay on the background until Hugh gets quite close, at least at this point. And once he drops down, the GH5 is slightly smoother, but there's not a huge difference. And locking on, the GH5 was slightly faster once again. Not a big difference though. Here, both of them went to the background, then they caught up almost at the same time. And when Hugh walks quickly, the GH5S does do a little bit better of a job keeping up with him. But overall, it's still a contrast detect autofocus system. So when there's tons of details in the background, it does struggle. Now let's talk about the dual native ISOs. This is basically two sets of circuitry on a sensor, one designed for lower ISO use and one designed for higher ISO use. Now this does help out with noise and decreasing noise in the higher ISOs, but on top of that, it allows you to have better dynamic range at the higher ISOs as well. So typically your sensor would have the best dynamic range at the lowest ISO point, and once you get higher, each step you go, the dynamic range is decreased. So here on the GH5S, the higher dual native ISO is 2500, meaning you could be shooting VLOG L at 2500 and still having good dynamic range, retaining that dynamic range compared to other sensors which will lose it after the optimum point. Now, with that said, I compared both at 800, which is the crossover point between the low and the high native ISOs, and I did not see much noise difference, and it doesn't allow you to go up to like 25 uh, with the low native ISO or kind of the base native ISO. Uh, so we're not seeing much difference here, but what we should see is if you're going to be shooting in the low light scenario at 2500 with the V-Log, you're going to get better dynamic range and you're going to have less noise at the same time. And the benefit with the Panasonics compared to other systems that shoot log is you can shoot at that 320 ISO when you're shooting outside in V-Log, which is most of the time the only place that I'll use any sort of log footage with any camera. And instead of being at like 800 or 1600 or 3200 on other cameras, you can shoot at 320, which is much easier to ND your lenses and be able to shoot that low. So let's wrap up this video. Thank you Panasonic for inviting me on this trip. It was definitely nice to hang out with all the different YouTubers and people that I've made friends with over the last couple of years and being able to shoot with this camera and compare it to the regular GH5. Now I do wanna point out that this is more of a niche product compared to GH5. I think the GH5 
uh, a lot of more people are gonna buy it. It's more flexible for photo and for video, and we do have the IBIS stabilization, and Panasonic admits that this is more of a specialty product. The GH5 is kind of the flagship for everybody. Then they have the G9 for photographers, and the G5S is set up for filmmakers that really need that low light performance, or for the higher end productions where the IBIS was getting in the way on the GH5. Personally, I'm not upset at Panasonic for not putting IBIS in there. Would I have liked that? Sure, yes, I definitely would, but it makes sense where they're coming from. A lot of higher end productions that were buying tons of cameras from them were having issues with the IBIS and the GH5 because it's never perfectly locked in place. Now, for most scenarios, you're walking around, you're on a tripod, it's holding the sensor steady enough, and that's done by magnets holding it in place. It's not having any issues, but if you attach the GH5 to a car rig, uh, off-road rig, anything like that where you have fast speeds, fast whips, or you have lots of harsh bumps, the sensor is not able to stay steady enough uh, to not have it affect it. So it tries to counter all those heavy bumps and it really messes it up. Here's a clip to show you guys the difference between the GH5S and GH5 when it's attached to a rig. And a lot of higher end studios were actually buying the GH4s, kind of downgrading from the GH5s back to the GH4s that they were using before uh, in order to not have these issues anymore. So with this camera, Panasonic kind of solved the low light, really gave us amazing low light performance, something I'd never expected from a micro four thirds sensor. Um, and they fixed that issue with a lot of those higher end studios being able to now use this camera instead of going back to GH4s. I know one of them was like Top Gear for their kind of crash cameras, they're in car cameras. So it, that definitely was a big deal. So if you need the IBIS, definitely go with the GH5. You're not going to get that low light performance, but keep in mind, you could still put a speed booster on there. You could still use a fast lens like an 18 to 35 Sigma 1.8. That really gives you advantage in the low light department while retaining the IBIS. So overall, I think Panasonic is doing a great job putting out a camera like this. I'm glad that they're starting to separate their lines and not just having one flagship, but hitting specific needs for different markets. I think a lot of people who already own a GH5 or multiple GH5s are gonna end up picking up and having one GH5S at least for those times where they need really good low light performance. And it really gives us much better performance than any other Micro Four Thirds sensor that we had in the past. If you guys enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and hit that subscribe button and enable those notifications if you guys wanna see more videos like this one. I am gonna get a GH5S in. I'm gonna be comparing it and doing more testing and doing like a more uh, longer term review, maybe comparing it to some Sonys. Definitely make sure you guys are subscribed for that. I also will have some links to the GH5S in the description below. If you guys wanna pick one up, please use those. That helps support us make more videos like this one. If you guys have any questions, make sure to ask in that comment section below. And if you're interested in seeing any other videos, you guys can go hit those cards right there and check them out. Thank you guys for watching. This has been Max, and I will see you in the next video.